in military history, can I tell you something? Those wars were terrible, but I think the, the issue for abortion is up to something like 60 million. Am I right, Kathy? Somewhere in that zone? St. John here from Right to Life, 60 million people uh, have died. And that, that's the, don't say 60 million fetuses. Don't say 60 million balls of tissue. 60 million human beings have been killed. And they thought, you know, World War II was bad with 20 million, you know, with the, the sacrifice of the Jews. And, and that's as awful as that was. Six million Jews and 20 million others that died. That doesn't even touch abortion in the United States since 1973. So, so huge, huge issue. Um, today is National, is, is Sanctity of Human Life Sunday which is uh, observed in many, probably most, especially evangelical churches um, nationwide. When we're, I'm not going to preach to you today specifically about that issue because we're in the middle of a service, but I, I, a, a series. But I do want you to be aware of the fact that organizations like Right to Life do a great job of bringing this up again and again, bringing it, n not, not hitting us with it, but reminding us of it. Because if abortion hasn't touched you lately, hasn't been around you lately, it's easy to kind of just kind of settle into the zone, isn't it? And do what you normally do. And kind of, it's not seen, it's not heard. And to, to hear that and to remember that those are real issues and that human beings are losing their life is a powerful thing. So they're going to have a table outside where you can get li your literature for them. Kathy will be out there. If you'd like to make a donation to Right to Life, they can receive that. They do receipt those you know, independently from uh, your Sunrise Church, but we'd love to have you take a part in that. That will be a blessing. Another issue that we want to make you aware of is just that we have an annual business meeting. Now, I kind of grin about this. Um, technically, if you're not going to be here for this meeting and if you're a member, and they check if you fill one of these out. But, I mean, if that's the case, then you can get an absentee ballot. We have four amazing people running for two board spots. We have Nick Sakachi, Cheryl Cray, Harold Melton, and Greg Sigwald who are running for our two open spots. They are all amazing people. And we are so glad that the four of them said yes. We think that they're all excellent choices. Um, but if you are a member and you are not going to be here next week, technically, you need to get this form from me. You need to take it home. I'll also put a Facebook post up for those who didn't know. And you're supposed to get this back to Dave Hoffman. Now, you, I'll, I'll make this really easy. How many of you know that slit out there by the sound room door? Slide it in that slit. That'll be the same thing as getting it to Dave Hoffman. Well, we'll accept that. Give it to me. I'll give it to Dave Hoffman. I don't, I don't look at it. You don't give it to me open. Give it to me sealed, okay, in an envelope because I'm not supposed to see it. Dave is supposed to see it. You get it to it. We'll get it to Dave. But what I really don't want us to do is if you come on Sunday, next Sunday the 26th, you go, I got a really good dinner and I'm a little hungry. Can I have an absentee ballot? We're not really aiming at that, okay? It's not an excuse to not go to the meeting. We, we want you to come and prepare because people come to present you with what we've done and how we've done it and what we want to do in the future. But, but this is to help you if you know you're not going to be here and you're a member. Please see me after service and get one of those, and you'll have a chance to, to express you know, your vote in that area. All right. I'm going to take you to the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 3. We are talking about the idea of culture, how our American culture can kind of infiltrate our lives, our, our, our church experience, our faith, and we have to really balance out what's going on, right? I'm not anti-culture. I'm not a hater of America or a hater of American culture, but we do have to be aware of the fact that problems happen. How many of you have ever had uh, radon discovered in your basement? Oh, nobody. We're one. Okay, what did you do? Did you like go down to fans blowing on you and say, try to get more radon? Did you, did you do that? Okay. And then it was good. It took the radon out because you didn't want it there. How many of you have any arsenic in your, your water and your well? Well, no, no takers. How many of you want more arsenic? Oh, we have one? We have, well, okay. So, so you probably didn't like that, right? You didn't ask for extra arsenic to be added. Oh, okay. So the, these elements can infiltrate, can't they? they? You didn't build your basement intending to collect radon. You didn't, you know, dig your well intending to drink arsenic. That, that's not wise. So, you know, you, you, when you find these things, you go, yikes, I better be aware of them. Our faith better not be based on our American culture. Let me say that again. 
Because sometimes, you know, there, there can be really tight connections between political ideas and our faith. And okay, yeah, that's whatever. But how many of you know that politics isn't what we worship? And American history isn't what we worship. Okay, it isn't. And, and American music and American movies aren't what we worship. Go experience those, have fun with them, but that's not what we're aiming at. We're aiming at Jesus Christ. That's what it's about. So Ecclesiastes is going to give us another topic in this cultural look-see that I think that we'll have a chance to, to see how it affects our lives. 3, 1 to 8. To everything there is a season. To our, a time for every purpose under heaven. A time to be born and a time to die. A time to plant and a time to pluck what is planted. A time to kill and a time to heal. A time to break down and a time to build up. A time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn, and a time to dance, a time to cast away stones, and a time to gather stones, a time to embrace, and a time to refrain from embracing, a time to gain, and a time to lose, a time to keep, and a time to throw away, a time to tear, and a time to sow, a time to keep silence, a time to speak, a time to love, and a time to hate, a time of war, and a time of peace. How many of you have heard this passage lots of times before? It's been said at funerals, it's been said at weddings, it's been said at civic secular events. I've actually been in a few civic secular events. There's no religious import whatsoever. And this is a memorial and you know, kind of a memorable enough statement that it can be added to a speech at a civic event. Kind of interesting. It drives home with repetitive strikes this idea that there is a time for events to happen. Now, notice it doesn't say everything. It doesn't say time to play video games. What's up with that? It doesn't say a time to change your oil. It doesn't say a time to eat cornflakes. I'm not trying to be ridiculous or poke fun at the scriptures. I'm saying, imagine if it said a time for everything that any group of people in every situation might do. How many of you would get bored after? How many of you find that just reading this, your brain kind of glazes over at about verse 5? And I'm not picking on scripture. And you're right, we have time and a time and a time. We get into a rhythm and, you know, you know, okay. And sometimes we can check out if we've heard it before. Now imagine if everything was in there. It would just, you'd, you'd quit. You'd never get very far. Instead, the passage goes through normal events. How many here have been touched by birth or death? Now, it says a time to mourn. You know, how many of you know that you can celebrate a birth? Some people mourn a birth, sadly. You can celebrate a death, sadly. Some people mourn. More people mourn death. That happens with a normal human event. Planting, harvesting, or starting and finishing any project. Anybody have projects you've ever started or finished? Yay! Okay. Normal. Okay. Uh, what about the, the idea of sorting out the things that you own? Now, there are people who don't do that. They're usually called hoarders. And, and again, I'm not stomping on anybody. If that's you, help is available. Um, whether that's help to not do it or help to get rid of it, I, I'm not sure. But we do sort things. What about the idea of repairing items? How many of you ever repaired something? How many of you probably shouldn't be given tools to repair anything? Okay, a few of us go, yeah, not my thing. Okay, some of you are brilliant at it. Great. Okay, um, what, what about the idea of profit and loss? How many of you have to, you, we're getting into tax season. Yeah, you're fun, right? How many of you look at the end of the year and say, dear God, is that what I made? Or is that what, how much I have to pay? Or yeah, yeah, right? Profit and loss. Normal human things. What about our desire to speak? How many of you sometimes are just, you just it's all you can do to not say something? How many of us sometimes just withdraw into silence and we don't want to say anything right now? We don't want to talk about it. We don't want to dig in. Yeah. Normal human response. By listing normal human events, the message is, you know, lets us know that they happen. But is that all? I mean, one of the things I suppose you could learn from this particular passage is that normal issues are inevitable. You could take it that way. Stop worrying about them. You can't dodge them anyway. How many of you know pretty much everybody dies? Yeah, pretty much everybody dies. It's one death for one life. It's pretty much how it works. Okay, so, so don't worry about it. How many of you know that you can plan and plan and plan and try to get around it? Some things just can't be escaped. Okay, that's a little depressing, but I suppose you could learn from that from it. What about the idea of stop worrying about it because the God that holds you holds all those events too. 
The God that knows you knows you're impacted by birth and death and jobs and retirement and all the other stuff, and he cares about that, so he's making plans behind the scenes. Great. That will be a more reassuring thing, and I think also scripturally true. But here's one more thing that might be more important than the events themselves. It's the word time. There's a time, an occasion, a purpose for all things. There is one who makes things happen in that time. God is in control of all things. And we need to realize he has a plan and a clock by which the world is unfolding. And that clock affects you and me. And yet, I think sometimes the problem is, is we pay very little attention to it. And I'm not saying that to smack you down or smack me down. And if I smack you, I'm going to smack me too. I'm just saying I think it's so easy to not look at that clock because there are other clocks that we can see. We're beings bound in time. We sense it differently. Have you ever gone to a movie with somebody? Okay, guys, I'll, I'll, I'll throw this your way. This is your bone today. How many of you have ever gone to a movie with your spouse or your date that you really didn't want to go to? Okay. And she sat there, and the movie was playing, and you're like, oh. And she's like, oh, oh, it's a great film. And she's loving every minute of it. And you're just going like, oh, can this please get done? You know, so for her, I mean, the movie's done in 10 minutes. It's great. And she wants to talk about it. And it was like the biggest two-hour waste of your life. You love her. That's why you're there. That's a good thing. Do those things. That's important, man. But the experience is different. Now you can flip it around. It could be the best football game ever, guys. And you're, wow, you can't believe how good this is. And your wife, because she loves you, went to the football game. And she's like, oh, please, is there anything I can look at? There are the costumes on the other side. You know what I mean? It doesn't care, doesn't want to be there. Different clocks. Now, let me give you one of my pet peeves. I know you didn't come to church to your pastor's pet peeves, but, but here's one of them. I do a lot of the laundry at my house. Any of the guys here do that? And I've been doing that long before Diane got sick. So, okay, just kind of one of my jobs. All right. I do laundry. And we have one of those washers which uses fuzzy logic. Now, no, really, that's what they say it is. I'm not making that up. Hey, that's funny. Fuzzy logic. Lint. Oh, I, did, I caught that. I was late. All right. Um, if you put clothes in and you select a cycle, the unit doesn't just pick a time and grind it out. It's not like the unit says this will be 25 minutes, and you can set your watch, and 25 minutes later the clothes are done. No, 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 no. No, it's too smart for that, or dumb, depending on how you, how you put it. You put your stuff in there, and on our washer, the normal cycle says 52 minutes, which means nothing. And so you put your laundry in there, and it actually, like, weighs what you put in there. And it senses kind of how it's there. And, and because if it doesn't like the way it's running, it'll actually change its speed and make the – it's really weird, okay? It does all this weird stuff. It, it decides all kinds of stuff, how hot the water is. It can warm the water up inside the washer if it doesn't like what you've get, given it from your hot water heater. I don't get all that, okay? It determines how soiled the clothes are by what buttons you push. And it says – I've got a plan. Now, it only tells you that it's going to be 52 minutes. But it has a plan. So as it goes, it's adjusting and changing. How many of you have washers like this? I'm not the only one because my mind's old, okay? All right. Yeah, you, only, you know exactly what I'm saying. So you look at it. Now, sometimes you get lucky. And it skips a few minutes, you know? I mean, it's like oh, 15, 12. Hey, cool. Where'd three minutes go? And mine seems to end a lot when it says it's got three minutes left. Five, four, three, click. So, wait, wait, where was two? Where was one? You stole that from me. Yeah, but it's good. I get it out early. But at the same time, the thing that drives me nuts is my washer can say it has 20 minutes left, go 20 minutes, and then just drop to 19. And it literally sits there and says, sensing, 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 sensing. So what are you sensing? You have clothes in there. How hard can this be? They didn't turn into tuxedos or plate armor. You're still close. Click, click, click. So I don't get it. I've looked it up. How many of you know what I'm talking about? Some of you are looking really serious here like you're analyzing it. Some of you are laughing because you've been there. All right? It's just, it's a peeve. Now, the point is, is see, I, I'm trying to get the point of different clocks. The clock in the washer isn't finished till it's done. And the washer has a magnetic lock. I can't just rip the door open and pull the stuff out. It's like going to one of those, you know, laundromats back in the day. It locks. 
So, okay, I have other things I want to do. How many of you get in the spot where you have other things you want to do? You have work that you need to do. You want to play a game. You want to talk to your wife. You want to get dinner. You want to do something else you want to do. And you know what's going to happen. Just as soon as you start doing that other thing that's important to you, it's going to go, and, and it's going to spill all the clothes out. And you got to go down there. And you don't want to have to do that. I mean, it, it, it's kind of an annoying thing. It's clock and my clock are not sinking. Now, I know, who cares about washing machines, especially if you don't do laundry? How many of you have experienced caring for a child? Yours, somebody else's, doesn't matter. You've ever done that? Okay. You ever heard the, you have five more minutes before we go to bed story? Now, what does five minutes mean to you? Five minutes. It is eight 25. At 8.30, I am going to put you in bed. Because at 8.30, I want to watch my show. At 8.30, I need to do some work. At 8.30, I just want to have you gone. <laughs> at 8.30, that's how it is. Boom, I am waiting for liberty at 8.30. For that child, it does not mean that. It means, oh, okay, five minutes is until my show is over, until my book is done, until my video game is finished, and then maybe we can start thinking about starting the bedtime process, which will involve snacks and running around and giving hugs and all the rest of that. And maybe by 10, maybe I'll be in bed. Five minutes doesn't mean to you what five minutes means to that child. Different plots. The last one, and then I grab another scripture. How many of you have ever been to, maybe you've ever watched on TV a football game or a basketball game? And it says there's 10 minutes left on the clock. And just like my washer, that means nothing. <laughs> well, it does. It means that there's 10 minutes left of regulation game time play. I, I, I understand that. But in real life, that could be 30 minutes. It could be 25 minutes. It could be 40 minutes. You have no idea how many commercials are going to scram into that thing. It, it's just, it's what it is. Different clocks. The clock in the game matters to the game, like the clock at a, at a space launch matters. That puppy doesn't go until you get five, four, three, two, one, boom. I mean, it doesn't matter how many hours that takes. Different clocks. Now, the question is when you're looking at different clocks, do you catch everything? Now, I know I, I talk about Nora far too much, so I'll keep it brief. All I want to say is that I find myself noticing the little things that she does more than I did with my own kids. Why? Because I didn't love my kids? No, I, I love them a great deal. How many of you love your kids? You may not always like them, but you'll love them. <laughs> I love my kids. They mean a lot to me. And yet, I start thinking, I do remember things as they grow up. I mean, mine are 23, 26, and 30, and they're all with me this weekend, which is kind of fun. That doesn't happen all that often, but... Mom is going in for surgery on Tuesday, and uh, so they're all here to be with us. And all they remember, I remember them saying things and doing funny things, and I remember games that we used to play and forts that we used to build in the basement, and all that was a lot of fun, but I couldn't be there all the time. You see, I, I was the dad. I had to spread my attention around three children, and then I had was one of two adults that had primary responsibility to go to work and do all that other stuff. So, so my wife remembers a lot of things that I don't. I know I miss some important things along the way. Because my wife will say, do you remember when? <laughs> and I'll go, no. No, I don't. I don't even remember that happening. Do you remember when we went on vacation and we went to that restaurant? No. Remember that time Alyssa said, no. I mean, I was there, but I have to live these experiences out through her memories because my focus was elsewhere. How many of you have ever been there? You love these people, but your focus is elsewhere. Hmm. Hold that thought. We'll get right back to that idea in a second and turn in your Bible to Galatians 4. Galatians 4, 4 and 5. It says, but... When the fullness of time, fullness of the time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. 
like the passage in Ecclesiastes, this New Testament passage shows us the reality of God's timing. How many of you know Jesus did? It wasn't random. God didn't sit there on the throne with one leg up over the arm and chuck a dart at the wall. He said, oh, yeah, that year. I think I'll send him then. How many of you know God was looking at faith and language and politics and all? Because it just amazes me historically that Jesus dropped into history at the moment when his people could go out and share the gospel message in an entire empire with free travel and a common set of languages and a common money. It made sense. It was a place where the Jews had gone from Spain to Arabia and they were everywhere in between and this message could be spread. Now, I'm not saying God couldn't have done it another time, but he chose a moment. In the Bible, these scriptural moments are called kairos. That's a Greek you know, word. Kairos moments, special times in which God has decided to do something amazing. Now, from our end, we don't know, right? We don't know. Did God make up his mind from the foundation of the world, like with Jesus' arrival? Or did he decide ten minutes ago, before something happened in this service, that this moment was going to arrive? I don't know. I can't tell. I don't get to see behind the stage and understand God's process. But I can tell you when godly moments, when kairos moments arrive, if you're paying attention, you go, whoa. When that feeling hits your heart, when that idea hits your mind, when the connection of the crowd and the people and everything come together and you go, whoa. That is a God inspired, an inspired change of mind, an inspired directional change in life. These are moments on God's clock. Now the easy thing would be to say, well, if God has picked a moment, everybody gets it, right? Whether you're paying attention or not, a God moment will invade your schedule and grab your attention and have its impact. No. No. We just went through the Christmas story, right? How many people really got it on Christmas night? Some shepherds. Joseph, Mary. If you go spread it out eight days, Anna, Simeon, two old people at the temple. If you spread it out maybe up to a year or two years, you get a couple of wise men in their entourage. How many of you realize that that's not many? How many of you know that the vast majority of people living in Israel at that time didn't know and didn't care what happened on Christmas night? Jesus came, and they didn't get it. Now, we could say, well, Pastor, you're being unfair. I mean, this was prophecy. They weren't supposed to get it. Everybody wasn't in the stadium waiting. Okay, I'm just telling you, something amazing happened, and the people living three houses down had no idea that angels were in the sky. None. The people that, you know, were, were down on the next street over when the wise men showed up with gold, frankincense, and myrrh had no idea what those funny-looking people were walking down the street. No clue. It went right by them. Well, but that was a small event. Okay, let's go to the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. Here's the funny thing. How many of you know that that changed the spiritual life of literally billions of people from that point on? That was a kairos moment when God came on the scene and allowed for our lives to be changed. That means everybody's saved, right? No. No. How many of you know that there were people standing there watching Jesus die that didn't get it and didn't accept it? There are people that we know and we love right now in our world that very likely will go to their graves without knowing Jesus or following him. And there are billions of people on this planet that haven't heard and frankly don't care. Kairos moment? Absolutely. But simply because it's on God's clock, that doesn't mean it automatically happens to you. Back to Nora. As I said, I find with her that I notice more. I spend more intentional time with her. I'm fascinated with the words and ideas that come out of that little mouth and mind. I love to see her smile. 
I love to just cuddle up next to her and watch her play her games. But see, I can do that. I don't have to primarily worry about her life future. She's got a great daddy. I'm not her daddy. Daddy can be daddy. I can be grandpa or papa. It works out well. The point is that the clock I'm looking at has a lot to do with what I see. I can be looking at the daddy clock, the work clock, the I got to be responsible clock, and I can punch through and I can raise three kids and miss a lot of stuff. Or I can be on the papa clock and I'm just paying attention to a three-year-old blonde-headed girl. And my life is totally different than what I see. We can be on God's clock and paying attention to these amazing moments when he steps in and he makes a spiritual change. He leads us in a new direction. He gives us a new command, a new principle. And we can say, that's for me. And we can let, bring that in and our life will be different. Or we can ignore it entirely and focus on our own ideas, our own goals, our own plans. And God's plans can go right by us and not change us at all. As they wrap up, I'm getting there. It is so hard to get my eyes off my clock. Look at James chapter 4, 13 to 15. It says, Come now, you who say, today or tomorrow, we will go to such and such a city, spend a year there, buy and sell and make a profit. Whereas you don't even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? It is even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanage, vanishes away. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we shall live and do this or that. Let's start at the beginning of that passage rather than its end. It might say, you who say, as if there's this large group out there that don't. But how many of you know that planning for what I want is pretty normal? I mean, some of you are, and we've talked about this, some of you are amazing, detail-oriented, fine planners. Good for you. How many of you just get up in the morning and you kind of hope that you make it to lay down at night? Yeah, and that's good, right? That's good. You're going to work. You're going you're gonna to do stuff. You're going to be responsible, but you don't have everything planned out to the nth degree. Good for you, okay? No problem. I'm a little bit more like that than, than, than the super planner, and I understand. But planning to get what you want, planning to find what you need in, in your life is something that we do as humans. And do we live in a culture that tells you over and over and over and over and over, if I said it as much times, I'd put you to sleep. Our culture tells you again and again in every form of media that you deserve to get what you want. And that companies and politicians and stars and athletes are going to help you get what you deserve. And if you really believe that, I've got some property to sell you in the Everglades. But we make good money in our culture telling you that, we, that you deserve everything that you want. You're nice people. You're hardworking people. You should have what you want, what the other guy has. What, there should be nothing unfair. No one should be able to get in the way of the alarms you have on your clock. True? Did I just make that up? I'm a grumpy old man? Don't think so. When I flip on TV, I get on the computer. How many of you notice that all you have to do is think about a new toaster and it pops up on your web browser? Yeah. Poof, Amazon's got a new toaster. How did it do that? I, I don't know. My kids think, I don't know if this is true or not, it probably is, they talk about things and their phones listen to them and all of a sudden they start getting ads for those things. Now, I don't know if that's true or not. A little eerie if it is. Is it? Oh, it is. See, yeah, see your phone like listens to you. That, that's, that's a little concerning. Okay? Demographics. They, they'll find their crowd for sure. Okay? Now, even preaching this, even knowing better, it is so easy to be focused on my own set of alarms for my own personal clock. It is a powerful habit even when I know better. I understand why. I understand why people referred to here in James 4 planned and dreamed about making business trips and making money and doing the things they wanted to do. You see, we may know that our experiences don't always line up with the way others see them, that there are lots of clocks for lots of people in the world, but we also know there's one clock whose ticks cannot be avoided. 
there's only so much time in your life. Now, if you want to make a connection to Sanctity of Human Life Sunday, here it is. How many of you know that there are 60 plus million people that never got to have one click outside the womb, one tick on that clock? Because somebody ended their existence before they ever saw the light, the light of day. And when you add to that the number of children who are wanted desperately and they're stillborn, they have some other medical issue and they die soon after birth, this is millions and millions and millions of people. On the other hand, Betty White just turned 98. Okay. So I don't know whether the ticks on your clock are going to be short or whether you're going to have lots and lots of them. For you, I hope there's lots and lots of ticks. I hope that 30 years from now, you look back and say, I remember vaguely something you said about time. It would be great. But we know that the ticks will someday be done. And that seems to put pressure on our schedule, doesn't it? How many of you have bucket list things that you'd like to do? Places you'd like to go. Things that you'd like to experience. And at some point in our life, we begin to say, Do I have enough time left? Can I get it all done? Oh, Pastor, you depressed us so badly. No, no, no. This, will, this thought will come. Trust me. Tick, tick, tick. We plan and prepare or we lose the chance to do whatever we wanted to do. That's why it's so easy to focus on my own clock. It is. Then we get to the end of the passage. Our life is but a vapor. It appears for a little while, and then it vanishes. Now, it would be so easy to read that and go, but I better focus on my clock even harder. Because you never know what's going to happen. It's such an easy jump to go from one to the other, right? I mean, you know, if I'm 20, are you 26? 25, I just gave him an extra year. If you're 20, 25, your life probably, statistically, you've got a good long stretch ahead of you. How many of us have less time than him, probably? Yeah, yeah, okay. It is what it is. So we can focus so easily on the amount of time that I have. It's easy to do. In fact, I find myself wanting to make that jump right now. On and off. You know, in 2018, we got an opportunity to take one of those bucket list trips and go out west and see all those parks, and it was a lot of fun. And we tried to take you along with us by making some spiritual connections here or there. And it was fun. And I worked on that trip for about 10 years. I mean, I drew maps. My kids laughed at me. I had this atlas with all this, you know, highlighter on it. How many of you ever done that? Or if you're old enough, you had the AAA trip ticks. Ooh, that's going back. Okay, you know, yeah, and you drew that all out, right? You had it all done. And, and, and you, you, I talked to Dan. I knew where she wanted to go and you, where I wanted to go. And you're trying to come up with numbers and budget. But, of course, at the time I started doing this, I still had three kids at home. And then I didn't. And then I had a grandkid. And I still hadn't gone. And then we got to go, and it was great, and it was fun. And so in my head, it was like, you know, there's still another one we like to do. But that'll be five, six, eight, ten years out, right? I mean, lots of time. Yeah, we're only in our 50s. We'll get there. And then my wife was told she had cancer. Now, I'm not becoming a bummer. Do I think she's going to be fine Tuesday? Yes. Have we been praying for that? Yes. Do I have the ability to believe God's going to heal? Yes. Yes. I'm not doubting that. But I'm telling you, what happens in your mind and your heart is you're looking and you're realizing you don't have a guarantee of five years or ten years or two years. You, you don't. And that puts pressure on even me. I mean, I literally sat there and I said, I don't know how to do it and I don't know when it's going to happen, but I'm going to get you on that Southwest trip. We're going to do it. We're going to find that happening. It's so easy. It's so, it even sounds noble sometimes, doesn't it, that, that we're going to do what we want to do while we have the time to do it. I, I understand that. And yet, the end of this passage says, if the Lord wills, we shall do this or that. Here's the question. Do we ask him? In a culture that screams at us that there's only so much time, money, and opportunity to do what we want, and that time and money and opportunity are running out while we talk, do we find ourselves chasing our tail to do temporary things because they seem like the thing to do at the time? 
because our culture screams, you got to get it in, you got to get it done, you got to chalk it up? Or do we find ourselves asking God what he wants us to do? It's a fundamental question, isn't it? I'm your pastor, and I'm preaching to you, and I find myself focusing on my problems a lot. And it is so easy to do. So no blame here. This isn't, I figured it out, you spiritual losers. Get on board. <laughs> no. No. I'm there. I am right there with you in the trench, as muddy as you are. It, it's how it works. Okay? Do we stop? And say, what does God want me to do? And not just occasionally, not just when we're graduating from high school or just when we're going to get a new job or just when we're going to retire or just when we have kids. Am I doing it regularly? God, what do you want me to do today? Now, here's the thing. If you're listening and he doesn't tell you anything, then I guess you can do what you want. I mean, as long as what you want isn't obviously sinful and rebellious, go for it. You know, eat the peanut butter crunch as opposed to the, you know, the the Cheerios, whatever does it for you. Turn left on the road instead of right. You do? Which way to turn? <laughs> Which way should I go? Yeah, perfect. But think about that for a minute. If you ask and he doesn't give you anything, then obviously he's fine with the decisions that he knows are resting in your heart. But if we don't ask, will we notice? And if we're in such a hurry to do what we want... Will we ask? Folks, the church is meant to be a light in a dark place. Jesus, yes, saved you so that you could spend eternity with him in heaven. That's a good thing. I much prefer it to the alternative. But that's not the only reason I'm saved. Part of his will is to change me and through me, spread the message to others so that they can find change and liberty too. Some of that is active evangelism, like Rick leads. Some of that is prayer ministries, like Amy leads. Some of that is worship, like Pastor Doug leads. Some of, there's lots of ways to do it. But are we asking each and every day, God, what do you want me to do today? One last scripture. It's a powerful question. Here's a question behind it. Isn't it my life? And if we serve a God of grace, can he understand what I want to do? Doesn't it say in the Bible that he gives us the desires of our hearts? Won't chasing my clock be okay with him? We live in a culture in which even Christians are thinking more and more like this. It's amazing all the events and issues which stand in the way of fellowship or service or change or sacrifice. We can rack those excuses up and events up all day infinitely and not even notice that we're doing it. It seems so fair, so logical, so expected. Well, I agree, and I've already said that we only have so much time. Nobody lives eternally in this body, in this world. Jesus died. And he came back, and then he ascended. You've heard of Enoch and Elijah? Elijah went up in a chariot of fire. He didn't die. Enoch just disappeared one day. Do, 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 went to God. Cool. But on this world, nobody lives forever. But is it my life? Galatians 2.20 says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. You see, I was so messed up, so broken by the choices of the race and my own personal ones, that I could never stand before God. I could never have fellowship with God. I could, ne I could never do it. I wasn't good enough. I couldn't earn it. And Jesus had to die to buy my life back. so it's not mine anymore. It's like me having a gambling fit. I don't, thank the Lord. But me having a gambling fit, losing my house, and some great, kind person buying my house back and letting me live there. It isn't my house. It's their house. I just live there. It isn't my life. It isn't my life. It's his. 
What does it mean to say I live by faith in the Son of God? I live by His grace. What does that mean? I think about a friend of mine who's a pastor who had a terrible heart attack, has less than 10% of his heart left, and has one of those pumps. He has one of those turbo pumps. It's, it's on his belt, the you know, battery pack is, and there's little wires that go in his body. He has no heartbeat. It's a trip. The pump does all the moving. It doesn't go boom, 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 boom. It's just, it's just a turbine pump. So if you check for a pulse, it ain't there. Now, how many of you that sounds just really kind of weird and Star trek and everything, yet, right? But think about it. I mean, any of us, I realize any of us could have a heart attack at any minute and just stop. I mean, that, that's a scary reality of life. But we don't expect to, right? We expect to keep going. But imagine if your batteries ran out. It kind of gives you a different picture, right? It would be like my friend saying, the life I live, I live by the grace of this thing. Now, he would say it's still the grace of God. He knows the Lord. That's a good thing. But understand, that technology is keeping him moving. That's an interesting illustration, isn't it? How many of you think you want to take care of that? You want, I, I don't know what you do. I don't know how you charge the thing, take it out, fall over. I don't know how that works. I've never asked. But I bet he takes care of it. I don't think he goes swimming. If we understand that this isn't my life, asking God, what do you want me to do today, gets a lot easier. If I stay all wrapped up in the fact that it's my life, and I don't necessarily ask as quickly. Let's bow your heads for a minute. How many of us could say this morning, Pastor, I realize that looking at my clock is what I do most of the time. I'm not asking if you love Jesus. I'm not asking if you're saved. I'm not asking if you're going to heaven someday. Those are all good things. I, I pray that everybody is in here does know him. If you don't know him, today would be a great day. You could raise your hand right now and say, I need Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior, and I'd be happy to pray for you. I wouldn't embarrass you in any other way. Just slip that hand up, slip it back down. I'd be happy to pray with you. But I know most of you pretty well. I'm pretty sure you're all, you've already made that decision. So how many of us could raise our hand and say, you know, I find it really easy to stare at my clock, my life, my plans, my wants, my goals. Four of you. Wow. I'm guessing it's probably more than that. And that's not a critique. I've already said I do it. I'm in there with you. I'm not saying, notice today, I didn't say your desires were wrong. I didn't question them. I didn't say, that's bad, you shouldn't go there. Nah, not the point. I just said, are you staring at those? Are those the focus of your will and your time and your energy? Because if they are, it's time to ask the other question. God, what do you will that I do? What do you will that I do? And the danger is he'll answer. If he answers, we're kind of responsible to follow it, aren't we? But we were all along. Lord Jesus, you see us this morning. We're people called to do something specific. To live out the life that you gave us. Just like my friend with his battery pack, Lord Jesus, you... You're our battery pack. You're the only reason that we function. And Father, if we truly think that we're utterly independent beings, independent contractors to do what we want, how we want, then we're foolish. If my friend unhooks that switch or that, that pack, he's done. If we disconnect from you, Lord Jesus, really? We're done. So Lord, we want to ask, what do you want us to do today. God, I ask you this. We open these altars and we take just a few minutes that you begin to show us what do you want us to do today. The altars are open. We ask you not to leave right away. We're going to do one last thing as we leave. Let's just take a few moments and actually ask God that question. Altars are open.
This is a vision. There we go. Oh, my voice came back. This is a visual reminder that we share a message and that the life we live is seen by others. Amen? Look at the right clock. God's clock. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. See, the cool thing is, is if we follow God's clock, we find that our clock falls into sync. If we follow our clock, we find that most things are messed up. Share the message. Let somebody else see the truth of the value of life, whether that life is a child that is just being born, or whether that life is you and I, ooh, there you go, that one took, living out the message he's given us. Spread the story. Spread the story. Amen. Come to the Father.
changes things. Drop a candle in your house, you can have unintended consequences. So I realize that if we walk out of here, we're going to blow these out because like trying to carry them around and balance coffee and drive your car, that would be a little risky. But let me tell you something. It's not only fire just changes things, God's life changes things. So he's giving you a life and he's giving you a clock to live it by. Go out and change everything. You have to blow this candle out. Don't blow yours out. Keep sharing the story about the value of human life, whether it's a baby and you're doing something that is political and social and trying to save those lives, that's important. Or whether it's spiritual directly and you're trying to share the message of Jesus Christ or disciple a kid or whatever you do. Blow this candle out. Never blow out the good news that's in you. Lord Jesus, I ask you to bless this congregation as they go. Lord, I do understand there is some, uh, there's a place out in the foyer where if they want to leave a video message for Jim, who, Lord, we pray for, I know he's kind of at the bottom of, after his bone marrow transplant, he's got no white blood cells, and, Lord, everything is slowly coming back up. Lord, we're praying for Jim, and people can go and leave a message in video for Jim. Lord Jesus, they can leave a message in video for my wife as she gets ready for surgery. But, Lord Jesus, we thank you for that and for the people that are making that happen. But God, I ask you that it's not just messages there, but messages everywhere. Messages in a restaurant, messages to our family, messages in the way that we live our life. What would you will? We thank you and we praise you in your mighty name. Amen. 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 God bless you.